أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعسومين واللعنة الدائمة على أعدائهم من يوم ظلمهم إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم طلب العلم فريضة صدق الله العلي العظيم ورسوله الكريم وأهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين سلوا على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Before we commence tonight's discussion, I would firstly like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for granting me this opportunity to speak amongst the mu'mineen and mu'minat of Pakistan. As a speaker and as a student of the seminary, it's always a great thing for us to come across different kinds and cultures of people. The fact that we are sitting here in Pakistan in the city of Lahore, where one finds himself living in the UK and studying in Iran, there is no doubt that this is the love and the mawadda of the Ahl al-Bayt which has brought us together. And for this we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For those that are aware and those that are unaware, tonight's discussion we have chosen the topic of the services of the ulama in the subcontinent and the importance of knowledge as a whole. And also, as you are aware, we are commemorating the passing of 40 days of the respected and honorable Sayyid Nawazish Ali. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless his soul. We find that one of the most important factors within a person's life is knowledge. When we look into the books of a hadith and when we look into the Quran, we find that knowledge has been given the utmost importance. As an example, when we look at the first chapter within the book Al-Kafi of Shaykh Kulayni, the first chapter is Aql and Jahl. The first chapter, before the Quran, before the Prophet, before Tariq, before anything, Shaykh Kulayni opens the book with Jahl and Aql. First point. Second point, I'm sure from the manabir and the pulpits, brothers and sisters have heard numerous narrations that highlight for us the importance of knowledge. An example is the famous tradition where someone came to Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they said to him, Oh Ali, tell us which is greater, wealth or knowledge? And the people continued to ask Amir al Mu'mineen, and he continued to tell them the credits and merits of knowledge. And after 10, 12 times, the people said that, Oh Ali, we keep asking you, and you keep giving us different answers to why knowledge is greater than wealth. He said, If you kept, kept coming to me, Till the day of judgment, I would keep answering you in the same way. Making it clear for us that knowledge has a lot of value. Also, when we look into the other narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt, we find is this famous narration that I quoted at the beginning, where the Prophet himself says that, Talabul ilmi faridatun. Now, 
This narration we find in our, the books of our brothers also. And there is a slight difference in the way it's been narrated. We find that in works like the, those of Sheikh Nasiruddin Tusi, he's mentioned this riwayah that I have brought in the beginning as Talabul Ilmi Faridatun ala kulli Muslimin wa kulli Muslimah. However, that which is muttafaq and that which is common amongst both schools and there is no difference of opinion upon is the part that I recited and this is the actual important part of the hadith. Why? Because if we were to look at whether or not the Prophet said Muslim or female Muslim, it's not as important as it is for us to know what is compulsory upon them. So the Prophet says that talabul ilmi faridah Seeking knowledge is a responsibility. It's an obligation upon all Muslims. And if we look into history, one of the most, if not the most important aspect we find of religion is knowledge. If you to take out knowledge from any school of thought, any religion, you are left with nothing. Therefore, making it clear for us that if we need to discuss something, it's the importance of knowledge. Whether we look into the verses of the Holy Quran and we look at those that are sadiqoon and rasikhoon fil ilm, it becomes clear for us. I mentioned in one of my clips on social media that there is a consensus amongst the Muslims that the first five verses of chapter 96 of the Holy Quran were those that were revealed upon the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, iqra' Bismi Rabbika al-Ladhi khalaq Khalaq al-Insana min alaq Iqra' wa Rabbuka al-Akram Al-Ladhi allama bil-Qalam Allama al-Insana ma lam ya'lam these five holy verses were the five and the first verses to be revealed upon the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. The first word is Iqra. Everyone is aware that that means read. The fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the first revelation has chosen this word we need to ponder upon this because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Hakim He doesn't do anything which is vain He does not do anything which is abath So therefore the fact that Rabbul Azza Jalla wa Ja'la He has used these words We need to think about this Iqra Bismi Rabbika alladhi khalaq Read in the name of the Lord that has created. Reading is the only way that a person can gain knowledge. However, some people might think that I don't have to read, I can listen. However, when we say reading is the only way, what we mean by this is this is the only way that initial knowledge is gained. Initial knowledge. Hearing is secondary knowledge. For example, this is being recorded and people are sitting here. The knowledge that you brothers and sisters and those that are listening now or later on, they are receiving is secondary knowledge. It's knowledge which has been heard or read by someone else. So what I'm saying, I've either heard from someone or oh, I've read this. If I've not read it, the person who I've heard it from has read it or heard it from someone else. This chain continues until it reaches someone who was ordered to read. And that is the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Also within these verses we find that the word Iqra has been mentioned twice. The first verse and the third verse. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these opening verses has used the word qalam. Iqra and qalam. So we have to read and there's the mentioning of the pen as in writing. So without taking any more time 
on these five verses, it becomes very clear that the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has used these words and the fact that he has mentioned read twice and not other words twice, this is all the bahs and the discussion of balagha and fasaha. Inshallah on another occasion we can discuss it. But as a dalil and something to highlight the importance of reading and knowledge as a whole, it's quite clear from these five verses of the Holy Quran and some of the narrations that we quickly went through. So it becomes clear that knowledge is very important and the importance of knowledge is clear. But the question arises, where do we attain knowledge from? And when it comes to the Shia school of thought, there is no doubt that this is a deep-rooted factor within our theology and our principal beliefs. That when it comes to understanding the holy verses of the Qur'an, because we want to gain knowledge, and that the Qur'an says itself that it's tibiyanu li kulli shay, it's the informer and it has the knowledge of all things. So when it comes to seeking knowledge, we need to take it from the Qur'an. However, the Qur'an we can't understand on our own. And as the Shias and the believers of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, we believe that if you want to understand the Qur'an, you are in need of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. So therefore, when we look into the Qur'an, when we look into other discussions and knowledge as a whole, we seek knowledge from them. But then the question arises that when the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam are not with those in the obvious and apparent form, who do we approach? My time is very limited, so you have to stay with me. My speed is uh, going to say like this because the topic that I have chosen is uh, something that I can speak and those that know me for at least 10-12 uh, majalis easily. So I'm trying to mention the, the most important general points within the time that we have so that even though it may seem that there's a lot, I'm hoping that for brothers and sisters that this topic is uh, at least food for thought so that when they go home they understand especially towards the end of the discussion some of the things that I uh, intend on saying they will realize that many things we think we know however we don't and the basics and the grassroots are the most important so when it comes to seeking knowledge we know that for example the Quran needs interpretation and when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt they are not with us physically so how do we attain this knowledge how do we, knew, how do we know that when we pray we are praying correctly how do we know when it comes to the birthdays and the days of the martyrdom of the Imma, which is the correct date? When it comes to opening the fast, what are the timings? When it comes to going to pilgrimage and they have made these new roads around the Kaaba, can we do tawaf around this? All these questions arise. So therefore, when it comes to deriving the ahkamat and the rules of the Holy Quran, we are unable to do so. When it comes to directly approaching the Ahlul Bayt like Zurara and Muhammad ibn Muslim and Abdul, Abdul Rahman, they would approach, for example, Imam Sadiq, we can't do that. So what do we do? This is where it becomes clear for a person of intellect and knowledge that they need to go forward and ask the experts in the same way that if I want to build this building, this auditorium, I will not go to Sayyid Sistani and discuss this matter with him. Why? Because he is not an expert in this field. In the same way that when I need to build a house, I will not go to my GP and physician. For surely they do not have knowledge about engineering and construction. I will only go to those people that are experts in that field, who have knowledge in that field, who can guide me. So therefore, when it comes to matters of religion, and when it comes to rulings and affairs of religion, we need to refer to the ulama. And now this is a silsila and chain, which within the last 15 minutes, I have just come to this point. That when it comes to understanding the importance of knowledge, we need to know where to gain knowledge. And therefore, when it comes to the knowledge and science of Islam, we need to refer to the ulama. There's many verses within the Holy Quran that highlight and emphasize the importance of seeking knowledge. And when we look into the religion of Islam, Subhan al-Khaliq, we find that for every single Muslim, in order for the community to work completely and function properly, we have something called wajib kifai, which I'm sure you've all heard of. That means that in a society, if there is not a doctor, it becomes wajib, it becomes compulsory on every single Muslim, male and female, 
to become a doctor. However, if one person becomes a doctor, sakata anil ba'ad. It becomes unobligatory on the rest. Because this has been fulfilled by one person. The same is for a person, for example, who cuts hair. Can you imagine if we didn't have barbers? Such a small thing. Can you imagine if we didn't have people that would clean the streets? Can you imagine if we didn't have people that would account for the money that comes and goes? In the religion of Islam, brothers and sisters, this is something which is compulsory upon everyone. However, if one person acts upon it and it suffices for the community, it is no longer compulsory upon others. It's the same case when it comes to religion. In the same way that it was for engineering, doctoring and all the fields, it's the same for religion. When we look at Ayah Nafar, we find that it's compulsory upon one person to take this step and go so that they learn about religion and when they come back to the people that they live with, they inform them. So we find that every community is different. For example, the ulama and the scholars that live in Iran, their way that they approach the people there, the dealings and the masail that they come across may be different to those in Iraq, those that are in, for example, Europe, America, Australia, Africa. That's why the Quran emphasizes that everyone min hum ta'ifatun from them, from amongst them. Why? Because when they study religion, because they are from those people, they know, for example, how to speak the language, they know what the culture is, they know what the masail are, they are able to relate to those people better. Which brings me nicely onto the point of how is it that the ulama and the scholars of the subcontinent have been at the service of the people of the subcontinent? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Muhammad wa Muhammad. We find that before the taqseem and the partition, the subcontinent had a different setup, geographically I'm speaking. And we find that similar to different eras, any cracks, any difficulties that the ulama seen that the people were facing, either with their speeches or with their pens, they defended the religion of Islam. There's many examples I can give, and some of our works in English are devoted to the life histories of ulama. Where a person can actually come and read How is it that this marja This alim How did they live their life What did they wear What did they used to eat And I have the view After reading and discussing with experts When it comes to The histories and life histories of this, the, the scholars especially of the subcontinent That those services that we find that the ulama and the subcontinental scholars have provided for Islam, not even those from Iran, Iraq and Lebanon have done the same. We find that because of the condition of, for example, Pakistan, India, there has always been this discussion with this, the scholars of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah all the time. Why? Because here, for example, you have a Shia mosque, next door you have a Sunni mosque, so we find that in the subcontinent, this has been a continuous way of discussion, whether it's by speeches and debates or through the ink and pen. That scholars have always been busy in refuting and proving their school of thought. The discussion of the Tuhfa Ithna Sharia is a discussion itself. And those that have heard of Abdulaziz Dahlawi and the Tuhfa Ithna Sharia that was written nearly 200 years ago, and was published and the different kinds of criticisms that were thrown upon the Shia school of thought till today believe it or not this might be new for some brothers and sisters till today certain Sunnis and people from the Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah school of thought have this view that this Tuhfa Ithna Sharia is a book that the Shias have not replied to even websites have been created that this is the book that the Shias have never been able to answer consisting of 12 chapters if I'm not mistaken from the concepts and dogmas of Imama and Tawheed and the Ahkam of the Shias 
They think that it's a book that has not been refuted. However, this is a misunderstanding. And we find that the first refutation that was, that was given upon this book was by Mirza Kamil Dahlawi, Shahid al Rabi. He was buried in Agra. Unfortunately, all the volumes of his actual manuscript are not available. However, when we look into the books of Tarajum, we find that this is the first complete answer to one volume. One volume written in the refutation of Shias. However, 12 volumes in reply. One volume for each chapter. In Hindustan, in India, I was recently informed in Madrasatul Wa'izin, which is a famous madrasa in Lucknow, there is a book that is in Urdu. And this is also a complete answer to Tawfa Athena Sharia in 15 volumes. And this is when I say 15 volumes, when I say 10 volumes, when I say 100 volumes, it's easy to say this. However, when a person puts pen to paper, they realize writing one page is so different. For this event, for the Imran will know that when it comes to even mentioning the dates, the name of the scholar, the topic, three or four times they send it to the person and they send it back. This is one poster. It can take a day, two days for it to be edited. Edited, sorry. But when it comes to the works of the ulama, when we say 10 volumes, there was no rubbers. It was ink and wooden pens for them to write these answers. So, we find that the ulama have literally given their sweat, blood and tears for preserving and maintaining the religion of Islam. More closely, instead of speaking about the subcontinent, now that we are in Lahore, as a speaker, it's always good to mention something which the people can relate to. And we find that here in the city of Lahore, there has been the passing of many great scholars, contemporary and in previous times. I'm sure everyone sitting here has heard of Gamesha. The famous Imam Barga is there. But I ask those that are present, and do you also ask those people that have gone to Gamisha and they have gone for the ziyara or majalis, etc. Ask them and I'm asking you. And if you know this, you are very lucky. In Gamisha, there are the graves of many people. From amongst them, there are two elevated and honorable luminaries. The first is Sayyid Abu Al-Qasim Ha'iri and the second is his son Sayyid Ali Ha'iri. Now, if you have heard of these names, Ahsantum. If you have not, let me inform you. When it comes to these great personalities, time is very limited. But all I will say is that this father and son, Sayyid Abu Qasim Ha'iri is the father and Sayyid Ali Ha'iri is the son. Together, they have written a tafsir in the Persian language. It has taken over 60 years to write, 65 years if I'm not mistaken. Combined effort between father and son, 65 years for them to write this tafsir. Unfortunately, unfortunately, this tafsir of the Holy Quran, not once has it been published completely. Not once. You know, in our houses we have Nahjul Balagha, Sahifa Sajjadiyya, we have Mafatul Janan. Mafatul Janan was written a hundred years ago. Sahifa Sajjadiyya is a riwayah and narration of Imam Sajjad alayhi wa salatu wa salam. The Nahjul Balagha is the work of Sharif Radhi who passed away in 406. These are not books that were written yesterday. The fact that we have these three books in the house, in our homes, we need to ask ourselves what are the processes that this, this book we have within our house today. Unfortunately, this tafsir by the name of Lawamat Tanzil, and what a name, Lawamat Tanzil, the shinings of the revelation. According to Alama Mara'ashi, alayhi rahmati wa ridwan, he says that it's unfortunate, and I'm quoting word for word, I'm just translating. And this what I'm saying is mentioned in the 
the magazine and journal by the name of Shaha. Everything that I've mentioned, people that know me, I will give the references for. But because of the limitation of time, and the time has flown by, I have not been able to do so. This is what I'm quoting. His son, Sayyid Mahmoud, quotes it from his father. And this is the final part, and inshallah, if there's any questions, we'll take them. So just to recap quickly before I mention this amazing quote from him. We discussed within the limited time that we had that knowledge is of the utmost importance. And we mentioned quickly, when we look at the narrations and the verses of the Holy Quran, this is explained easily and very um, apparently in the verses that we have and the narrations that we mentioned. Then we wanted to discuss the importance of knowledge and the way that we receive knowledge and attain it. It has to be from the scholars. And we mentioned the chain that it comes down. And we also mentioned that when it comes to every different society and different places of living and cultures, it's vital that similar to other fields and sciences that the way people are businessmen, accountants and doctors, we need to have people that specialize in the field of religion. And it's the same case for when it comes to Islam, we need to refer to the experts. And we mentioned that when it comes to the religion of Islam and the services that have been provided from the scholars of the subcontinent are second to none and those services that we find that have been prov uh, provided from those scholars of the subcontinent in certain fields have not even been provided and done by those from the scholars of Iran, Iraq, Syria and Lebanon and other places due to the climate and the conditions that the scholars of the subcontinent were living in and because we are living and are speaking in the city of Lahore in Pakistan in order to highlight the importance of scholars and the khidmat and the services that they have provided, we give the example of Sayyid Abul Qasim Hairi and his son Sayyid Ali Hairi. And to make this clear, we mentioned that they have written a tafsir of the Holy Quran, which unfortunately has not been published at all from the time that it was written. And this was a tafsir which took over 60 years to write. Lama Marashi, as we were mentioning, has said that if if this tafsir was to be published in today's edition, like you find the books in libraries, if it was to be compiled, typed, edited, and it was to be published in today's edition, the number of its volumes would exceed the volumes of Biharul Anwar. Can you think? Because the greatest compendium of books that we have <clears throat> within the Shia school of thought is the Bihar al Anwar of Allama Majlisi Ali Rahmati wa Ridwan in 110 volumes. If you go into the, the library, there's one there as well, I've just seen it. 110 volumes. Allama Marashi says that this book, which is written in Lahore, in the same city that you are living in, which has not been published at all in a full series, he says that if it was to be published today, the number of volumes would exceed those of Bihar al-Anwar. However, unfortunately, the inattention of people, and this is just one example, brothers and sisters, I personally, me, there was a time maybe five years ago, I went into the Jamat al-Muntazir library myself, and I took the pictures of all the books that I could find of Allah Mahari and his son. Me personally. I went there, I would stay there, I had my own camera, and I took it. Why? Because tomorrow, brothers and sisters, we are all to be asked, this wajib kifayah that I was talking about, we are all going to be asked on the day of judgment that when it came to defending religion, when it came to answering the opponent, when it came to putting the chest in front of the bullets, the scholars were there, they were killed for this, they used to go sleep hungry so that me and you, we could call ourselves Shia and the believers of Amir al-Mu'mineen. When we get asked on the day of judgment, what did you do for them? Because this service that the ulama provide, it goes in hand in hand with the layman. Which brings me on to the last part. Because we are commemorating the Arba'een and the passing of 40 days, of the honorable and respected Sayyid Nawazish Ali. One thing that if you go to Iran, Iraq, Qom, Najaf, Mashhad, Lahore, all the cities of Pakistan, if you ask them, how do you know Sayyid Sa? What will they say? 
is because of the way he spent his wealth in the service of religion. This shows you that when a person has money, this isn't sufficient. If you look into history, I mentioned this a couple of days ago in a private meeting. I said, out of all the ma'asumin, so all the anbiya, prophets, prophets and messengers and the holy imams, how many of them do you know that had extreme wealth? My question. Except for Nabi Sulaiman, who's ma'roof for having you know, this uh, throne, as we say, and the, the zahiri and apparent wealth, out of all these individuals that were chosen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that were guides for the people, who had extreme wealth? It's surprising how the youth go after something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't even go give to those people that he chose when he could have. Not saying that wealth's a good thing or a bad thing, it's clear. What I'm trying to say is that the way that wealth is spent is very important. Making money is very good. It's important. If anything, it's wajib. But the fact that this individual was so renowned and he was, will be missed by so many people. I know people that rang me on his passing. They said we never met him. Just heard his name or we read his name in the tafsir in Namuna that Sayyid uh, Saftar Hussein Najafi alayhi rahmati wa radhwan would say that I finished this chapter at Sayyid Namazji's house and the address. The question is, brothers and sisters, in the final words of this small speech, how many of us are attaining wealth, however, we are not providing for the religion of Islam? Because the more that you have, the more that you will be questioned. And sometimes giving your legal and obliged dues is not enough. The more you have, the more you can give, the more you should give. And that's what we find, and this is my personal belief, that when it came to this companionship and friendship between these two great people, Sayyid Saftar Hussein Najfi, who was given the title of Muhsin al-Milla, and the khadamat and the services that he provided, I have the firm belief that he would not be able to do so if it was not for having that supporting shoulder of Sayyid Nawazish Ali. And more so, Sayyid Nawazish Ali would not become Sayyid Nawazish Ali and that respected and honorable individual if it was not for Muhsin al-Millat's guidance. So we find that religion goes hand in hand with wealth and this is a very, very good model for us. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, and including myself, are able to provide services for the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam so that on the day of judgment we can help hold our heads high and say that yes, we tried to help the cause that for which you were all martyred and that you've seen difficulties. Now, if there's any questions uh, from the brothers and sisters, whether or not they would like to ask them from the microphone, I don't know, or that they would like to write them in, Inshallah, if we were able to, we will try to answer them to the best of our abilities uh, after the loudest of salawats. <laughs> Even I don't mind if the, the questions are not in English. I can answer them in English and other languages, Urdu as well. Does anyone, if it's easier for the brothers and sisters, however they are easy, inshallah. <coughs> When it comes to these great scholars, subhanAllah, there is a book by the name of Sawana Qasimi. Um, it's been published as well in Arabic, in Urdu, and Persian, and English. It's not been published in English, however. The reason I'm saying this is because um, with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have been able to publish six different works. Recently, before I left, 
uh, a small treatise was published that we critically edited. But the first book that I ever worked on, and I actually translated and I edited, were the life history of Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri. So Ana Qasimi is um, a treatise, a book, which was written by Sayyid Ali Ha'iri amongst the tafsir which they both wrote. If I'm not mistaken, it's the, the 15th volume of the tafsir. The son, when he finds out that his father has passed away, he writes his father's biography. And the ulama say, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's the 15th volume. Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri writes the 15th volume and he passes away. And after the passing, his son continues the tafsir. The ulama say that have read the tafsir, the manuscripts. They say that it's impossible for a person to find where Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri left the tafsir and where his son continued. It's impossible, you can't tell. And this was the first uh, work that I worked on. Unfortunately, it's not been published. Inshallah, um, it's a very complete work. The reason it was not published is because I was waiting for our, one of our um, s s teachers, said Mohsen Kashmiri, may Allah protect him. He had some annotations and notes on the book. So I did not want to publish it incomplete. So I was waiting for it and then uh, we got busy in other works. However, it's a work that I have written on. And when it comes to the history, we find that <clears throat> their ancestors were from Kashmir. And within the book, because it's about the father, Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri, it mentioned that when his father, who used to trade in uh, Pashmina, the famous Kashmiri cloth, um, he was traveling, and it was during his travels that Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri was born. And Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri studied in various places under some great ulama. Um, and the fact that he's called Ha'iri, for those that don't know, that Karbala is uh, referred to as Ha'ir, Ha'ir al Hussein. So, therefore, certain scholars they either call Karbala'i in the way that they call Qummi, Najafi, Lahori. Uh, he was referred to as Ha'iri because of his studies in the holy city of Karbala. And then um, he was traveling to Hajj and they were passing through. Uh, Lahore and at that time the the famous Ghazal Bash um, were here I'm sure that they are the lineage still continues here and long story short they requested Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri to stay in Lahore and um, on his travels he came back to Lahore after the pilgrimage and then he became settled in Lahore with his son and um, they continue to work for the religion of Islam in a way that is uh, spectacular because they have worked in some topics that I personally have not found other works for example in the Pakistan and the subcontinent there is always this bone of contention I know within the sheikhs it won't be that much but within the Sadat there is and that is whether or not if it's permissible for an Alawiya uh, a Sayyidah woman to marry a non sayyid so, Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri has a small risala discussing whether or not it's allowed by the name of Ibahatul Hashimi, Lighayr al Hashimi. This famous tafsira is amongst his works. He was a marja taqlid, as we have today. He has fatawa, he has treaties, for example, there is one. And this is all from memory. And I did the tarjuma of Sayyid maybe nine years ago. So, this is all of memory. Um, he has a book by the name of Ardul Utaq. I'm sure in the majalis you have heard that when Sayyid al-Shuhada came to Bani Asad in Karbala on the 2nd of Muharram, he does a mu'amala and a transaction with the tribe of Bani Asad and the discussion of how much the land of Karbala costs, what he gave, how did he give it, did he give it as a hiba, did he gift it? Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri has discussed this in this book. So the treaties and rasail that he has written, again, like I said, that are unique uh, because of the questions that the people would ask. So this is a brief, a very brief, uh, because it does not give justice uh, to speak about such scholars in such brief ways. But 
that shows their greatness. The fact that you can continue speaking about someone for so long makes it clear how great and honorable they were. So this is a, a small history about them. Um, and also his son, um, he had great ties with the, the famous poet, um, Allama Iqbal. And he, they would have uh, sittings with each other. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, his funeral prayers were also led by Sayyid Ali Ha'idi himself because he had two funeral prayers um, and one of them was read by Sayyid Ali Ha'idi. But inshallah with your prayers, this is a book that especially uh, I am hoping will be published soon. Like I said, it has been translated into Urdu because the original is in Persian. However, in Arabic, Urdu and Persian, it has been published. Whether it was in a limited amount or not, I can't remember, but I remember its publication. And inshallah with your prayers and with the support of the brothers and sisters, it will also be published in the coming future. Sallu ala Muhammad wa Muhammad.
And for those of you who would like to visit, we'll be too happy to welcome you. Sure. And any question that you may have about the two scholars, for all I know, I can always pass it on. I'm available in Lahore. I live in BHJ. I can give my contact number. You should be interested and what is it? Uh, thank you for your coming over and sharing your thoughts with us. I, on behalf of everyone here, would like to compliment you and thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Sir, so, uh, you were talking about like, uh, the more you have, the more you will be questioned. So, whenever I give you the call of Allah, so the question that knows at the door of my health science and obviously mine is that I am okay, I am providing for a specific part of the community of Muslim Ummah, for instance, our Shia block part, that like we believe in Shia block part. Like that if you there is an ambiguity in my mind that we are not providing for our other Muslims, brothers and sisters, like uh, Sunni school of thought, the followers of other school of thought who, who believe in the oneness of Allah Almighty and the Prophet of Allah, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, did you speak the last phrase? I sent a very good question. When it comes to giving money or giving wealth, what should a person's priority be? It's a very valid question. Now, there's two aspects to this. The first aspect is that when we look into, for example, the riwayat and the Nahj al in particular, where I'm about to say from, is that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib says to Malik al-Ashtar, he says that, O oh Malik, know that your brothers are of two types. Your brothers are of two types. One is your brother in faith and one is your brother on the basis of humanity. When you look into the religion of Islam, brothers and sisters, you find that the amount of emphasis that has been given to welfare and social understanding, I don't think you will find that in any other religion. It's a separate thing that we might not have heard of it, but we don't know of it. However, when we look into the passage of the Holy Quran, especially Surah Baqarah towards the end, verses... <clears throat> 250 all the way to 286 if you look at those verses when it comes to the importance of charity and giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who you can and who you can't and where you should give it if you have time look at just the translation of those verses towards the end of surah Baqarah the second chapter of the holy quran so that's the first aspect that when it comes to understanding that we need to know there's two types of people according to Amir al-Mu'mineen and the, the light of the the narrations so therefore money is also spent in two different ways we find that there's charities for example there's an earthquake in somewhere around the world and there's an appeal to give money but then as the honorable gentleman mentioned there is a masjid for example that is being built in your town now the bahs and the discussion of which is which takes priority over the other is a separate discussion but sometimes it's very clear. Why? Because we say that in Urdu, they say that Jan hai to Jahan hai. If it comes to feeding a person, you would obviously give that priority over, for example, putting lights in a mosque. Because if these people are not alive, they will not even come to the mosque because they're not alive. And that's why we find that when it comes to giving in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not just money. Like I said, that how many of the A'imma do you know? And how many of the, the prophets and messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do you know that had so much money? If anything, if anything, when you look at Fir'aun, Qarun, when you look at all the, the enemies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had those riches. And where were they spent? When you look at Surah Nazi'at, Fir'aun says himself, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. So as I mentioned as well, when you have wealth and you, it's misused, it makes you claim that you're a deity and you're the Lord of the people. So coming back to what I was mentioning, that Amil Mu'mineen makes it clear that there's a division. And humanity sometimes, sometimes, is given precedence 
in the example that I give, if people are dying of hunger, not even religion, your uncle says that try and provide for this person. And then, even within the tasarrufat and the expenditure of khums and uh, zakat, the ulama have a consensus. And that is if a person, if they can provide certain services for the people that are living within their society, they take proceedings over other people. Hence why there's a whole discussion when it comes to certain zakat. You can't send it out of the country. It should be used in the country that you are living in. So, not to extend and prolong the, the answer, when it comes to giving wealth and giving uh, money in the way of Islam, that's one thing. But like I said, that's not the only way. Sometimes information, again as the, the gen mentioned, that sometimes if you have information about an individual, about a madrissa, about Imam Bargah, if you have some certain knowledge that we don't have, this is also giving in the way of religion. Because straight away when you say you should give in the way of religion, people get scared. People think that, no, I, I'm not stable yet, I can't give. Who said it's always financially? And who said it has to be a lump sum? Give, consistently give, even if it's little. So therefore, when giving in the way of religion, we need to know that we are fulfilling our responsibility. And all this taba'an is after we have given our legal dues. There's no point a person trying to give for the religion of Islam, as in charity for the religion of Islam, if they do not give their legal dues. If they do not give khums, and if it's applicable to them, zakat, if they don't give that, they should not even think about giving for the religion of Islam in other ways. They need to make sure that they are giving their legal dues. And as our teacher says, and I will finish on this, he says that if these two taxes, he says if khums, zakat, these two taxes, if they were fulfilled by every Muslim, not one Muslim would be poor. But the fact that we only have a certain amount of people that give khums, and they provide in this way for their legal dues. Alhamdulillah, we find that the, the Shia school of thought is in this form. Can you just imagine if everyone give their legal dues? Where would we be at? So therefore, it's obviously, because as someone that is donned in these clothes, I have to also give the legal aspect. And that is making sure that what is compulsory and wajib is first looked at. And then when a person has more to give, they give it in the way of Islam. And inshallah, Again, I could go on. We find that when a person gives in the way of Islam, it's for the nima and the growth of wealth. Because we think that if I give this in religion, I'm left with less. However, know the riwayat and the ayat say that when you give this, you are given more. So it's the way that we think in our ideology and perception of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inshallah, we can carry on giving in the way of Islam so that we receive the barakat and ni'mat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And just as a last note, because I think there's no other questions, um, as a finishing note, um, as the respective gentleman mentioned, within the holy city of Qum, I'm amongst those people that are privileged to be under the guidance of people like Sheikh Tahir Awan. And it's, it makes it clear for me when a person is so sincere and they are so clear in their intention that no matter where you are, you are always mentioned. This for me, he is my teacher and uh, a very respected person in my eyes. And day and night, he puts in, in the revival of the works of the scholars from the subcontinent. I remember when I went to Jamat al Muntazir, um, again, that was four or five years ago when I was busy taking the pictures. <clears throat> of the treaties and the works of Sayyid Abul Qasim Ha'iri and his son Sayyid Ali Ha'iri. And I requested for the manuscript of the ninth volume, if I'm not mistaken, the ninth volume of Lawam al-Tanzil to be given to me. So they opened 
the specific place that it was and I was standing towards the side and they went in and they it was covered in a cloth and they bought the tafsir they three size and as a person who writes and a person who knows the value of writing and how difficult it is to write I still remember that when I took it into my hands and I opened the cloth the pages were unable to be opened and it made me cry and I thought to myself the amount of effort that this father and son have gone through to write this tafsir of the Holy Quran I am amongst those who is responsible for why it is in it is in this state because the beautiful thing about religion brothers and sisters it's no one's inheritance it's not mine it's not his it's not hers whether you're young male female you have money you're poor doesn't make a difference for surely people did not come for religion more religion came for people and therefore it applies to everyone so when I was holding it I was thinking to myself how difficult it must have been for those scholars to write this in the conditions that they were living in with the busy schedules that they have can you imagine just think right now of a scholar that is famous who famously sits on the pulpit in the morning they are reciting a majlis in this city two hours later they are reciting in another city in a different country they are always busy Say the Qasim Ha'iri and his son were the exact same exactly the same if anything it was more difficult why? because the transport system was different the way that they would come and go from one place to another was different in our day that we are living in if, for example if a person wants to go for Hajj they pay, they sit on the plane, they sit on the bus, they do the Hajj and come back. A week, ten days. In that time, going to Hajj would take six months, brothers and sisters. You had to think of going to Hajj a year in advance so that you could plan what you need to carry with you, what you need to, etc., etc. There's no doubt that there's a hamad that they have done. And inshallah, I, I don't class myself amongst those people that are helping in the cause for only I am a student of the seminary. And it's from this institute that our works have been published. And again, I am only grateful that they deem me worthy amongst those people that their works are published for I am a no one. But as I always mention, that it's with the prayers of the mu'mineen and the service of the mu'mineen that we work together and we progress forward and we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us the tawfiq and the ability to practice Islam in a way so that the Prophet and the Prophet's family are pleased with us finally brothers and sisters are requested to recite Surah Al-Fatiha and Surah Ikhlas three times for the elevation of the soul of Sayyidina Wazish Ali after the loudest of salawats.